Okay. This is Stephen Downs from Mountain New Brunswick, and this is Personal Learning Environments in the Plank Online Course. And now I'm going to kill the music and turn it over to you. Okay, I'll just do a quick intro here, Stephen. Uh, Stephen Down works for, Downs works for the National Research Council of Canada, where he has served as senior re researcher based in Moncton, New Brunswick, since 2001. Affiliated with the Learning and Collaborative Technologies Group, Institute for Information Technology, uh, Stephen specializes in the fields of online learning, new media, pedagogy, and uh, philosophy. Uh, Stephen is perhaps best known for his daily newsletter, the OL Daily, which is distributed by web, email, and RSS to thousands of subs subscribers around the world. He has published numerous articles, both online and in print, including uh, The Future of Online Learning, Learning object, Objects, Resource, resource Profiles, and eLearning 2.0. He is a popular speaker, appearing at hundreds of events around the world over the, the last uh, couple of years. And uh, prior to joining the NRC, uh, Stephen worked for the University of Alberta as an information architect, and prior to that as a distance education and new media design specialist for Assiniboine Community College in Brandon, Manitoba. Uh, this followed a, by a decade of teaching experience in both in person and by distance with Athabasca University, the University of Alberta, and Grand Prairie Regional College. So um, actually how we got Stephen involved in this is a, a couple of us are involved in his uh, um, open course that he's running through Athabasca in uh, Plains. And uh, we, uh, we asked Stephen if he could maybe give us a little bit of a, uh, of a glimpse into this uh, new world uh, dealing with uh, personal learning environments and personal learning networks. So I'll leave it over to you. Thanks. Uh, I've just run into a situation where I've maximized my Paint Shop Pro and can't unmaximize it. Oh, how silly is that? Uh, so I'll just kill it, is what I'll do. Sorry about that. That's not the way I like to start these presentations by being unable to close something on my screen. Uh, there it is. In the process, go away. You go away now. All right, good. So, um, what I have on the agenda today, and I can't, I can't see any of you, so I'm sort of uh, uh, doing this uh, freehand. So, if you have any feedback or anything like that, by all means, totally jump in and say something. Uh, what I have in mind today is to talk about the uh, Personal Learning Environment Networks and Knowledge course that we are currently running online using uh, the Personal Learning Environment System and to talk a bit about personal learning environments in general. And I'm going to be mostly demonstrating stuff today, although... Um, I will actually uh, be presenting some slides as well, and I'm going to bounce back and forth between the slides and the the live action, if you will, on the uh, website. Hence the uh, the novel presentation mode. I'm recording here in Camtasia, here in my own office, and of course it's being recorded there as well. One of those will be the definitive recording of this presentation. Those of you watching the recording. Hi, it worked. Um, and uh, I'm also trying for the first time uh, a piece of technology called join.me. Here it is up on the screen. And all I did, it's beautiful. I love this, right? Um, you go to the uh, URL, which is join.me. And then you hit the, the big arrow that says share your screen. It downloads a little application and then pops up, I don't know if you see this, but it pops up a uh, join.me widget up at the top of the screen with uh, the uh, full URL for the current session. And so what I'm doing is I'm sharing my actual desktop with you. Yeah, we see it. Oh, you do see it. Excellent. So, uh, like I said, first time using that. 
uh, and therefore, as well, first time using that and attempting to record in Camtasia. So this is all a bit of an adventure. And if I can get you to mute your microphone again, that will uh, eliminate some of the uh, some of the feedback that we're getting. Um, yeah, Skype when there's nothing, when there's not no sound in the background, and Skype is on automatic microphone mode. What it does is it seizes on whatever background noise it can find and amplifies it. I have this at home all the time. When I'm on the road, I Skype home and my wife answers and she has the TV on in the background. And if she spends a few seconds not speaking, I get the TV, no matter how low the volume is, I get the TV full volume. Um, so Skype can be really annoying. It's very useful, but it can be really annoying. For those of you who want to eliminate, here's the Skype screen. It's just me. Uh, I don't have video from the other side. But there is audio, and the audio is being recorded. Anyhow, all of that said, let's uh, get to the presentation. The idea here of this course is that it is an instantiation of a teaching approach, an online teaching approach we call connectivism. And as the slide says here, at, at its heart, connectivism is the thesis that knowledge is distributed across a network of connections and therefore that learning consists of the ability to, to construct and traverse those networks. That's, you know, it's kind of a, a large claim. And on the other hand as well, it's kind of hard to imagine that claim being instantiated in online learning. But what we've done is we've attempted to create an online course that is literally distributed across a network of connections. And therefore, when people work in that course, they are actually traversing and constructing new nodes in that network. And our experience, and we've run a number of these so far, the one we're running now is the fourth of these, our experience is people really do learn this way, and they learn more than just how to create connections between networks. They, they learn more than just how to use the tools. They actually learn the subject matter that we're all talking about. But what's interesting is they learn it in their own way. They get their own perspective on the material. They are able to focus on that aspect of the material that's important to them and learn it in their own way. Uh, just one other note as well, in my own mind, and, and probably in the mind of others of us who work on this, people like George Siemens, and Dave Cormier, Rita Kopp, and others, the, the course that we're running, the, the idea of it being a course is kind of a convenience. Typically, learning in a connectivist network would be ongoing. And Indeed, many of the people that we have in these courses do continue to learn in an ongoing fashion before and after the courses. Uh, they, they create their networks of, the, of connections. They create their networks of resources. They continue to share. They continue to carry on the conversation. And they continue to learn more and, and deeper about the subject that they're interested in. So... Yeah, it's a course, but the course, as I say, is a convenience for the formal institutions in which we work. The idea of it being a course is not at the heart of connectivism. The idea of the network of connections is at the heart of it. One aspect of the course, and, and this is something that we've all felt is important, is that it is open enrollment. Uh, the idea here is that there are no barriers to entering a, a connectivist style course. Anybody can enter. We make it very easy. Uh, you just enter your email address, and you, you kind of need to do that to get any of the mail outs. Strictly speaking, you don't even have to do that because all of the material is openly available online. Uh, but you know, if you're going to be counted, if you're going to get mail outs, you have to give the email address. We don't even ask for a real name. Uh, although, interestingly, it appears that the vast majority, if not all, of the participants give their real name, which I find very interesting. The uh, 
course is originally proposed uh, on a wiki. And I'll pop into the wiki here. This is a wiki for the critical literacies course that we offered over the summer. So it's not the current course, but it's a previous one. And when we go into the... Oops, it's been erased. Okay, I'll go into a different wiki then. Uh, so let's go into the uh, personal learning environment. So this is the current course wiki. And so basically we have information about the course in here. And let's back up. Here we go. So there we go. Sorry, just having a, a little page link uh, brain cloud. So what we do is to structure one of these courses, we actually set up a set of topics that we want to talk about. And as you can see, we have 10 weeks in the current course and 10 topics related to personal learning environments. And then we have a, a page in the wiki for each one of the weeks and we propose various activities and discussion and readings. So here are the readings for the week, a number of things. Here are the online sessions that we have. And the idea of doing this on the wiki is that it allows people who have signed up for the course and received a registration, and again, you don't have to, but if you did, you received a registration, a username and a password, and you can actually go into this wiki page and edit the wiki page and change the structure of the course. And because it's a wiki, the idea is that what results in the course would be the uh, combination of what everyone wants to do. Now, that's the theory. In practice, nobody's done that. Uh, in, in practice, what has happened is we've put up the discussions that we want to have, and people have been happy to go along with that. I think the important thing is is, is providing the choice. Um, you know, people could go in and change it, and I imagine that in other offerings, especially with you know, once people are are much more used to this sort of online presentation, they would go in and edit the content, but certainly in these early days they haven't been. Another major element of the course is the course blog. So here's a sample. Oops. I was just loading here. So here here's a sample course blog. Again, this is the critical literacies course blog. And again we have a course blog for the connectivism course as well. Oh, sorry, for the uh, personal learning and personal learning environment, uh, Plank. I'll just call it Plank. Anytime I say Plank, I mean personal learning environments, networking, and knowledge. You can see why we never actually say the title of the course. We also have a blog in Plank. We're finding that the course blog over time is used less and less. When we first started these type of courses in 2008, we used the course blog quite a bit. Uh, critical literacies, which we offered earlier this year, not so much of Plank, we've hardly used it at all. The, the, the intent of the course blog was to have the uh, course facilitators or instructors or presenters, or whatever you want to call them, uh, put up content for the course. And what we found, we all have our own blogs, and we tend to put up course content in our own blogs and then bring it into the course. And that seems to be a more comfortable way for all of us to work. And so we haven't been using the common blog nearly as much as we did when we started. We also have a course Moodle forum. And the Moodle forum is your typical discussion forum. So here's the, uh, the Moodle forum for connectivism and connective knowledge. And as you can see, the discussions are organized the way the course was organized. In that course, we had 12 weeks. So, and here's the, uh, the actual discussion from uh, the connectivism and connective knowledge course. If, if we pop into the Plank course, here is the personal learning environments 
Networks and Knowledge course. And here's the home page on connect.downs.ca. And as you see, we have the uh, Personal Learning Environments course here as well with the discussions, and they look just like the discussions from the other course. So, and again, we've had a fair amount of chatter and quite a few people taking part in the course and in the discussions. The, uh, the, and this is one of the things that the open enrollment supports. The open enrollment supports massive enrollment. And for the most part, the courses have been massive enrollment. The uh, first connectivism course that we offered in 2008, we had 2,200 people. In Plank, we have 1,530 people. And this seems to be typical. Uh, we did have the question, do these things work with small enrollments as well? And the answer seems to be, based on our experience, yes, but not as well. Uh, the uh, Critical Literacies course had an enrollment, as I recall, of about three or four hundred. And when you have an enrollment of three or four hundred, you have an active participation of anywhere between one and ten percent of that. Uh, depending on the time of the course, uh, which means, you know, like 10 to 30 people in the uh, critical literacies course. And it worked. It worked just fine. But you didn't see the, the extensive and wide-ranging discussions that you would see in the larger course. So it works, but on a lesser scale. And, okay. Uh, Moving on in the course components. Uh, part of the idea of a distributed course is that there are resources all over the place. So in the original Connectivism course, we set up a PageFlakes site. And here it is. And the idea of PageFlakes is that it will bring in content and it seems to really, really want to bring in this story about four teams arrested in Winnipeg. I don't know why, but it brings in content from elsewhere. So here are some bookmarks, uh, here are some images, here's content from the Connectivism blog. And so the idea here is that this page plate site was sort of like a prototype personal learning environment. See, the, the, the big thing about a personal learning environment is just this activity. You have resources scattered in various locations on the network, and the personal learning environment is in some sense a tool to bring those resources together and present them in a single place. That's what the PageFlake site does. Now, uh, there's a lot of things about the page flake site that it doesn't do that we would like a personal learning environment to do. But from the point of view of somebody who is, uh, if you will, taking a, a consumer attitude toward the course, uh, it's just something that they want to read, they don't want to do stuff, they just want to read and follow, then the, uh, the page flake site is perfectly fine. This is kind of an interesting set of links over here. Uh, the photos for connectivism. And you can see different representations of the theory that were created by uh, participants. This is a, uh, uh, a concept map made by someone named Jane uh, using a tool called CMAP. And what else have we got here? We've got... Uh, here's another representation of the course, and uh, I'm not sure what this was created using, but again, it, it's interesting when people are learning in a connectivist model, and they're seeing the connections from one thing to another to another in the learning environment, they begin representing, as they should, the content in that. So this is a representation of the content of a connectivist course and 
it's a connectivist representation of the content of the content. It's not a structured hierarchical presentation. It's presented as this collection of interrelated concepts and ideas. And this this is the sort of thinking that we really try to encourage in the course. Here we have another image which will pop up here in seconds. And this is uh, another model uh, of competence assessment uh, model that was discussed in the connectivist course. And all of these are, are aspects or, or ways of thinking of the connectivist approach to learning. Just nuke that page there. And I'll nuke the page flight site. We'll come back to the presentation screen. Hope this all looks good over there. It's, it's sort of hard to tell what it looks like because I'm just—it's just me on my computer screen, right? So, anyhow, it's great here, Steve. Excellent. Uh, another major aspect of the course, and, and what we've found to be really important, are the regular illuminate discussions, and. We, we've tried different combinations of them, and the combination we've pretty much settled into is one on Wednesday where we, where we bring in a guest, and then one on Friday where the facilitators argue among themselves about the course content, and we also have a lot more student participation on the Fridays. This is one of the things with, you know, you have, you have a course of 2,200 people, and of course you're going to get a lot fewer than that in the Illuminate room. Uh, we have a license that uh, we can extend to up to, I think, 300 people. But generally, the most we've had in an Illuminate session in the Plex course anyways is something like 109. And that seems to be about right. That seems to be about where it tops up, uh, just naturally. And that makes sense, right? Because uh, it's a live event. It's hard to schedule. We schedule the events for 1 p.m. Atlantic time. 1 p.m. is like the world standard presentation time because uh, well, it's the middle of the day here, which is nice. It's first thing in the morning on the West Coast. You know, it's uh, like 9 a.m. on the West Coast. It's, uh, but it's also early evening, well, late afternoon, getting to early evening in Europe. Uh, and even in Beijing, it's still only midnight. So we cover most of the world. We, we've had unending complaints from people in Australia. Uh, but uh, other than the Australians and the New Zealanders and the Japanese, we're able to cover pretty much the rest of the world with the, the 1 p.m. start time. So we have the 1 p.m. Wednesday with the guest and the 1 p.m. Friday with the facilitators. And then... With a large crowd like that, it makes sense for uh, people who are, are well-known or prominent in the field to participate in the discussion because they know they're reaching a lot of people at once. And so we've been able to do that. We've been able to bring in fairly prominent speakers in the field. Uh, and the Illuminate discussion allows not just the live participation but also a recorded discussion. So we're able to reach, in fact, far more than the, uh, the 100 or whatever number of uh, people we get on Wednesdays and Fridays, but, but many more than that uh, in the recording. Dave Cormier, who uh, hosts a site called EdTech Talk, which does audio recordings. They do live audio interviews and podcasts and all of that. He says that... They have a certain number of people who attend the live presentation, but many, many more people, something on the order of 10 times more people, actually listen to the recorded presentation. I doubt that it's 10 times more people for the Illuminate recordings, just because it's a bit more involved and also they're a bit longer. But again, we can anticipate that many more people will listen to the recording than will attend the live presentation. Now... We have a, a recording queued up there. So, Dan, do you want to do the, uh, the presentation or the recording there? And I'll be quiet for a little bit. Okay, we will do. All right. Hey, Stephen. You're back on there. Okay. Oops. Uh, okay, I'll turn my microphone back on. And uh, I take it you can hear me again. I'll just confirm that. 
Uh, yes, we can. Excellent. So that's the Illuminate discussion, which I did not see from over here, but that's okay. Um, so the, the, the remainder of the course components that are distributed are the sort of things that you might expect. Twitter is another example. And in Twitter, one of the things that we do is we set up a course tag. So here's Twitter for connectivism from 2008 and the tag is CCK08, and as you can see, it was just wrapping up there uh, in 2008. Uh, for Plank, tag is Plank2010, and we had a long discussion about whether it should be 2010 or 10, and I like 2010 better for various reasons. And so, oh, don't say it doesn't exist. That's really not fair. Uh, let's go into Twitter and search for it then. <laughs> well, here's one of the problems with using Twitter. Um, so I'm not even going to linger on this at all. We'll all look at the fail well and sigh. Um, but anyhow, we have a, a Plank 2010 tag as well for the, uh, the uh, Twitter component of the course. One of the things that I really want to spend some time on because it's such an important component of the course, is something called the daily. Uh, in all of the surveys of the course that we've had, the, the daily has emerged as the most important component of the course, hands down. So here's what the daily is. Remember our uh, Plank course, and here's the website for the Plank course. The daily is essentially a daily newsletter that we distribute to everybody who signed up for it. You don't have to sign up for the daily newsletter if you sign up for the course, uh, but you can. And in practice, almost everybody does. We have 1,530 people in Plank. We have something like uh, 1,370 people subscribed to the daily. And, and they'll stay subscribed for the rest of the course. In uh, CCK08, 2,200 people. We had a steady run of 1,870 people subscribed to the, uh, to the daily. Now, the daily is composed of various parts. Typically, uh, there's announcements. Uh, you don't see an announcement on this one. I'll bring one up in a second that does have an announcement. Uh, then facilitator post. Remember I mentioned the uh, course blog earlier uh, and said that we prefer in the end to blog on our own sites. So that's what we do. And now here is a facilitator post that links to something blogged on one of our own sites. Then we have just what I call discussion posts. Uh, these are from the Moodle forum. And what we do is we aggregate new discussions that are created in the Moodle forum and list them here. And so anytime a new discussion is created in the forum, people see that in the newsletter. And then participants blogs, people who are registered in the course can create their own blogs. In fact, we encourage them to create their own blogs. They don't have to be blogs specifically. And then they uh, blog about the course in their own blog. So here's one of the participants' blogs. It's uh, uh, Ricardo Valenzuela Ruiz's blog. And so here he is writing in English, as it turns out, happily, uh, uh, about the course. And he's written that uh, today, uh, earlier today. So. So he must, have, he must be in Spain, because he would be writing it earlier today uh, if he was in South America, because the uh, newsletter goes up pretty early in the morning. So these are the posts that participants in the course created today. And then, as well, in the newsletter, we aggregate the uh, Twitter posts, or the tweets, I guess, more accurately. And so here we are. Here's a tweet. Let's we'll see if Twitter's over capacity again. Oh, sorry, we're just going directly into the link. So this is a link that somebody tweeted 
and we clicked on the link, and it took us straight into the tweet, into the link. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Here's here's the actual tweet, and here again we see a link. And connectivism secret, oxy talk. I think they mean oxy content. I'm not sure. Anyhow, uh, you never know what people are going to talk about in the course. So the idea with the newsletter is that it is sent out. Uh, it is sent out to everybody every weekday. And uh, so if we we can we'll pop back into the newsletter. And we'll pop into the archives. These archives, these are actually archives from, here's the original Connectivism course, so here's one of the newsletters from Connectivism and Connective Knowledge. And here's the uh, 2009 offering of Connectivism and Connective Knowledge. And here's the newsletter from the Critical Literacies course. And... Uh, of course, we have the, the newsletters from the current edition of the course. And let's see, today, so here's Monday. Here's the newsletter from Monday. And at the beginning of each week, we use the announcements to cover all of the events for the week. So here's, here's the stuff you saw in the wiki, right? Uh, the description, the readings, the announcements of the live sessions, facilitator posts. Etc. There were no new discussion posts because it was the first day of the week. We started a new weekly discussion forum, uh, and then the participants. These are the uh, the posts from Monday and the Twitter posts. So the idea is we send it up, and it's received an email by everybody each Monday. They love this. Uh, they totally love this. It's the thing that gives structure to the course. It's the way we're able to sustain uh, a, a distributed course with resources distributed all over the Internet. Now, what I'm showing you here is the back end of that system. This is the mechanism we use to manage the different aspects of the course and especially the newsletter. So, uh, what this is is something called Grasshopper. And if you're curious to look at it yourself, you can go to grsshopper.downs.ca. And there's the URL inside the Contagia. And this is Grasshopper. This is a uh, personal web environment that was developed here at the National Research Council. It is open source, and there's a new version going to be coming out reasonably soon. Now, what Grasshopper does is it manages this website and the newsletters. So, all of the people who are in the course, when they get their account, they're created here. And so there's a whole bunch of people in the course. I'm not going to linger on it because I don't really want to show all the emails. And all of the other course resources are located here as well. Now, I mentioned that individual participants in the course have their own blogs. Well, here is the list of blogs that have been created by students who are in the course. Right now, in the Plunge course, which, remember, has uh, uh, 1,530 participants, we have 230 of those participants actively creating blogs and blog posts which are being harvested by the system. So here it is. Here's the harvester. Uh, I'll pick one of these at random. So here's one at random, blue light district. Um, here's the HTML of that particular blog, which will pop up here in a second. Or not, depending. So. So, okay, not everything in the blog is about Plank, but that's okay. Sometimes things are about Plank. Sometimes things aren't. They're personal blogs, right? Here is the XML. Uh, and the XML is an RSS feed that's created by the blogging software. And this is the actual code 
that our system looks at and analyzes. This code is produced automatically by the blogging software, so we don't need to worry about it too much. And here is a post that has been harvested. So we've harvested one post from this particular blog out of all of the other posts. Uh, why only one post? There's only been one post on this blog that is referred to the Plank course. How do we know? Well, we ask people to use Plank somewhere in the post or somewhere in the body of the post or the title of the post. And that way we're able to sort between the posts that talk about the course and the posts that are, as you saw, photo albums. So, when somebody submits a new blog, I wonder if I have any newly submitted, probably not, because they're kind of, oh, here we go. Yeah, you never know when you get something that you need. So here's one that's just been submitted. Oops. And this was submitted sometime in the last day or two. Um, uh, Saran Maturi's blog. And so, you notice the options are a bit different. The, what I do here is every blog that's submitted, and when they submit a blog, they do that. Uh, it's a new feed. Here's the form that they use to submit it. They just put the title, the RSS feed URL, and that's really all they need. But the web page and description optionally as well. And when they fill in that form, it shows up here. And so now I have a chance to have a look at it. So I can pop into the information page. I can take a look at it and make sure it's a real blog. But most importantly of all, what I do is I approve it. So here we are. I have to remember, Seventeen. One day I'm going to get a nice... Uh, Ajax interface for this so I don't have to find it again. So here we go. And now I hit harvest and what, what has happened here is the newsletter soccer has gone out and harvested or retrieved the uh, information from that XML feed that you saw. So it's bringing in the content, sees the post, checks and see if it exists and all of these exist. Because as we saw right here, it's in fact a duplicate, isn't it? So it is a duplicate. So uh, 2609 is the original version. 2636 is a new one. I'm going to delete the duplicate because I don't need the duplicate. Well, let me just check. It might be... So I'm going to harvest it again just to check. Yeah, all the same links. Okay. So I'll just delete this one, and I'll keep my list nice and clean. Except I think I just deleted the wrong one. Uh, uh, did I delete Sean's by accident? Uh, see, this is what happens when you delete things while you're giving a presentation. So I'll just uh, take a note of that, and... Uh, Apologize to Sean later. <laughs> okay, never mind. So, uh, I'll delete this one for real this time. Okay, so that's fine, but how does that end up in the newsletter? Well, here's the list of pages that are on the website, and down here is the daily. And so I'll edit the daily, and this is the page that actually produces the newsletter itself. It's stored on the daily.htm, and if you went to the, uh, the uh, course website, oops, um, you would actually see it, and there it is. And here is the code which is used to produce the daily. And these are the different types of content that have been aggregated by the aggregator. So here we have announcements, like the wiki stuff that you saw. Here we have the facilitator posts. Um, here we have the discussion posts that are harvested from the Moodle discussion forum. 
and here we have the participants blocks. So, okay, fine. Uh, that's all perfectly murky. Let me give you a concrete example of how all this works. Real concrete example. Uh, one thing that people have been doing is using a site called Delicious. Oops. So here's the site Delicious to record their bookmarks on. Delicious is a very handy site. It's not really a blogging site. It's more of a bookmarking site. Uh, you just record a link that you found interesting and more importantly, you tag it. And as you can see here, the top tag on Delicious Today is BBC News, Happy Days, Actor, etc. And some of the tags, Television, Death, Days, Actor, Sad. Days is probably from Happy Days, right? Something. Anyhow. So, Delicious is what is known as a collaborative bookmarking site, which means that a whole bunch of people can join Delicious. Each person individually adds their bookmarks, but the bookmarks are shared with each other. So when you pick one of these tags, the uh, not just your bookmark, but everybody's bookmarks show up here. So Plank is a tag. And here is the Plank tag on Delicious. And these are bookmarks that people have stored on Delicious with the plank tag. And so here you see one, here's an article I wrote that was uh, uh, stored by Michael Chalk, and as you can see over here, added the plank tag. Uh, here's uh, a different item. So here, these are basically resources related to personal learning environments that have been tagged plank. So this is a really useful page, right? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just provide any of these new tags in the newsletter for people every day so that they don't have to come through Delicious. So here's what I'll do. I'll click up here on the RSS feed icon, and that gives me the URL of the uh, RSS page. And I'll copy that URL. And now I'll go back into the daily administration page. And I'll create a new feed. I could use that other page too to create this feed, but I'll just do it this way. So there's the feed and delicious plank tag. And I'll update the record. Okay, so now I've created the new feed, and when I list the feeds, I should see it there under D. And there it is. And because I entered it directly, it's already it comes pre-approved. That's why I did it that way. So now let's test that. Let's harvest this. Alright, so here's the harvest. So now we have a bunch of links in. These are the bookmarks that people have created on Delicious. So now I have the content in my system. If I wanted to look at it, here's the content again that I just harvested. This links table is all the stuff that's harvested from different people. Okay, well that's good. So how do I present that in the newsletter? Well, I can now go to the page that has the newsletter in it. And so I'm going to edit that page. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the newsletter a command to list the items where the feed is a certain feed. And let's just find out what the feed number for that was. It's the easiest to do it that way. And I've forgotten it already. Uh, <laughs> Where did it go? Delicious, D-E-L. Right, feed 2637. Let's just remember that. 2637. 2637. Normally I can remember a four-digit number without a problem, but when you're doing a presentation, all bets are off. Okay, so now I'll just create a new section. 
delicious resources. And I'm going to copy this bit because it's easier than typing it all out. This is a keyword command. So keyword database equals length expires equals 24. So sometime in the last 24 hours. Truncate 500. So it's no more than 500 characters long. Uh, type equals text.html, format equals e email. So type is the type of link that I want. I don't really need to worry about that here. Format equals HTML, that's how I want to display it. And then here, feed, I think it's just feed. I can't remember what the uh, field name is, so I'll look it up. Because even though I created this system, I sometimes forget. So let's just quickly look up what the name of that field is. So the uh, field is going to be a link. I'll show the columns, submit, and the name of the field is link feed ID. And we can see it right here. All right, so we'll go back to where we were. Is this where we were? I may have just closed the, the wrong page. I hate doing this live. Well, I don't hate doing it. You know what I mean. Okay, yeah, I've just deleted the... Uh, the editing that I've already done, so I'll start over here. This won't take a second, but the nice thing about this is it's really fast. So, actually, let me just make sure it's clean. All right, starting over. So, we'll come down here to Paste this again, just like we did before. Copy and paste. Don't worry about type. Format equals email. Feed ID equals two six two six three seven, and that should do me. So I'll update the record. And now let's see what the newsletter looks like. This is a test version of the newsletter. So here's the newsletter. If I were to print it right now, here's what it would look like. So the discussion posts. Here are the delicious links. And what, what my tag has done is taken these delicious links and inserted them right into the newsletter. And I'll click on the link. And it will take me to... I don't know yet because I've tried this link out. Oh, it takes me straight to the resources. Isn't that nice? So, and if I wanted, I could get a little bit fancy, and I probably would want to. So, um, come back here and get the URL. And come back in here and discussion post delicious links. Uh, links. Bookmarks, so this encourages them to go to Delicious. I'll update the record again, and as you'll see, there will be no surprise here, right? You'll, you'll see the text that I just typed in. So, without formatting, because I cut corners. And so now I can go there, they'll see that there. They can log in, create their own bookmarks. Now, what happens here, what's really important is they go, they do this stuff, they create this account, they add these things on delicious and then they forget about it and automatically behind the scenes the uh, course software brings in the bookmarks formats them presents them in the newsletter and sends the newsletter out by email every morning to everybody who has participated in the course and so 
as the course evolves, um, or as according to my whim, I can add different elements to this newsletter to increase the distributed nature of the course. I can bring in discussion posts from any open discussion, uh, delicious links if I wanted. I could import uh, images and photographs from Flickr in exactly the same way. Uh, I do exactly what I just did here. Uh, you know, it's not really a very complicated process at all, and that produces the daily newsletter. So, the rest of the, these slides here are the things that I've already shown you. The different elements of the course. Here's a course map that a student made. Oh, it's going to be very small. Let's make it bigger. Uh, this is an actual representation made by a student of the connectivism course. And the, uh, the Plank course is structured in almost exactly the same way. And you can see that the structure of the course is exactly one of these networks that we've described. The course itself is a linked network of distributed resources. The content, as you saw on the other diagram, is a linked network of distributed resources. If we mapped out the interaction among the participants, we would see it's a linked network of distributed resources. The course structure maps into the course content, which maps into the activities being undertaken by the participants in the course. And again, because the course is open, we have participants around the world. Although I mentioned the, uh, the 1 p.m. start time, that covers here, you know, maybe Alaska, if they get up really early, all of North America through to maybe the cutoff is like Iran or Pakistan. After that, it's getting a little bit late and the participation drops off a bit. So uh, we've had students create videos for the course. Uh, we've had students create their own Google groups. And of course, I can harvest Google groups, uh, RSS feed, and put it into the newsletter as well. Uh, we've had students create their own translations. Uh, here's a wiki uh, of the connectivism course that has been translated into Spanish. In the Plank course, we, ha we don't have such a strong Spanish participation. Uh, the big participation in the Plank course is German. I don't know why. I have no idea why that is. Uh, and they've created a wide variety of other resources supporting the course. Uh, Second Life, Dito, Delicious, as I mentioned, WordPress blogs, uh, a whole pile of things. And the idea here of the course, the theory behind the work that the participants in the course do is, uh, on the one hand, it has to do a bit with social construction, but not so much so. I mean, a lot of people look at what we do and they say, oh yeah, constructionism. Um, but it isn't so much because constructionism is more often process and results driven. Uh, and it's also more group-based and consensus-based. Here, there is no particular outcome. There is no particular content. We expect people to, to learn or acquire and you can work in groups if you want. We're not going to stop you, but it's not a requirement. It's not a deliberative, mechanical, construction kind of process. The idea in a connectivist course is that we're creating what we might call personal knowledge. Uh, and what we're trying to do is literally grow knowledge in the brain. Uh, on, the, on the connectivist theory of pedagogy, to, to learn is to develop a network of connections in the mind, a, a neural net. Uh, learning is, in fact, personal growth. It's not the acquisition of content. It's not the receiving of instruction. It's the actual sh change of shape that happens in the human body, and in particular in the human mind. It's a matter of organic growth. It's not something that, you know, it's like, you, you can't just say, uh, I'm going to uh, be able to run a marathon in four hours and just 
make that happen cognitively, it doesn't work like that. Uh, you actually have to practice running and practice maybe marathons even before you can run a marathon in four hours. I have no idea how long it takes to run a marathon, by the way, so I'm just guessing at a number. I really have no clue. Anyone who knows me can determine that just by looking at me. Um, and so the model of the personal learning environment is that the personal learning environment is like an exercise machine. It's a tool intended to immerse you in a community, uh, immerse you into the workings of the community. And what happens is you get into this community, you start using the vocabulary, you start working with the artifacts, you start doing the same activities as practitioners in that community already. In a personal learning environment, networks and knowledge course, we are putting people into the personal learning environment research community. We are that research community and people are participating in that community. What happens in the course is, is not we have a bunch of knowledge about PLEs and we're going to present it to you. Totally not. Um, first of all, we might not have that knowledge. PLEs are in your field. Uh, secondly, even if we had that knowledge, that knowledge might have changed. It's the internet, right? It's the 21st century. Things change. Uh, thirdly, even if we had that knowledge, and even if that knowledge didn't change, that knowledge is complex. You can't get at it. You can't put your hands on it. It's like knowing the weather. Well, you can sort of know the weather, but you can't know the weather. It's like knowing a forest. You can sort of know the forest, but you can't know the forest. There's too much of it. It moves around too much. Uh, there are too many factors involved to actually know it. So there isn't content that we just know and present and then students receive and suddenly somehow know. Rather, it's we are practitioners in this field doing our stuff in this field. And the list of uh, weekly topics that you saw at the start of the course is not a curriculum per se, but rather the set of things that we as practitioners in the field decided we would focus on one week after another week after another week. Now, we do research in this topic, we work it around, we discuss it, uh, we search for resources on it. Uh, in other courses, we might actually create something related to it. And the participants in the course are along for the ride. Except they're not just along for the ride, they're not just idle observers, they actually help us. They participate in that research effort themselves. They contribute to the research effort. They're not lead researchers, they're maybe not even secondary researchers, they're not officially apprentice researchers, but they are people who are practicing at being researchers and developers of personal learning environments in the personal learning environment community. Now what happens is when they do that, they acquire these skills and capacities, not acquire as in receiving, but acquire as in growing and developing. And what's neat about that is we don't get all focused on uh, you know, what might be called the highlights or the abstract points or you know, the, the one, two, three points of what it is to build a PLE, uh, you know, the way somebody might memorize uh, the, the five steps of practice or the eight stages of development or whatever, they learn or require knowledge that is unstatable, ineffable, not even known by us. Uh, if you ask the PLE developer how they go about developing a PLE, they might say one, two, three stages, but they actually do something that is a lot more tacit than that. It's what Michael Polanyi called tacit knowledge. And it can't be expressed. Literally, you cannot draw it out, codify it, and present it. It's just knowledge that is not expressible. But if you participate in the activity, you can nonetheless acquire it through the process of doing the thing. The idea of working in this environment is related to uh, the theory of constructionism as articulated by uh, Seymour Papert. The idea of manipulative materials 
the idea of learning things by manipulating materials, learning by doing, and learning by presenting, learning by doing this in a public environment with other people, so that you're not just doing these things, but you're getting the feedback. So you're not just getting the practice, but you're getting the reflection that helps you correct that practice. Uh, there's a little picture of constructionism. Uh, it's also a form of learning that is an empowering form of learning. It's a form of learning that involves and requires people taking control over their own learning. The biggest difficulty that we have in a course of this type is getting people to get past the I present, you listen, you repeat mode of learning. Uh, people, when they come into these courses, want to be told. They want to be told what to learn. They want to be told what's on the test. Uh, they want to be told what they have to do in order to succeed at this course and get the certificate. And the reason why they do that, of course, is that that's what they've been taught education is their entire lives. And the problem, well, there are numerous problems with that method, but one of the major problems is that it leaves all of the power in the hands of the instructor and none of the power or very little of the power in the hands of the recipient, uh, which is fine if you want a top-down hierarchical kind of society. But the problem is in more and more environments, more workplaces, uh, more situations, people have to make judgments of their own. Uh, the workplace is becoming more distributed. Our societies are becoming more distributed. People have to take more control over their own lives. They, everything from control over their own health care to control over their own learning environment to control over their own finances and, of course, control over their own education, which means taking control over whatever is an important part of learning whatever. And if the learning pedagogy learning pedagogy, you know what I mean, if the pedagogy is contrary or contradictory to the empowerment that participants have to have in order to be successful in the field, then we're undercutting the task of learning itself. So those are the main things that I wanted to say in this presentation. There's, there's still some time left, but I, I wanted to sort of sketch the theory a little bit, and that's pretty much the end of the formal presentation. And I think we still have some time for uh, comments and questions. And I think this would be an excellent time to entertain those at this time. So I'll, I'll turn over the microphone to Dan, and I'll bring up the, uh, the nice screen with my web page on it, and uh, take any questions or comments at this time. OK, so any questions from the group? Oh, no. it's here. Do I move forward? Probably better to move uh, forward and make sure you fix it up. Uh, hi, Stephen. Uh, I'm Scott Butler. Can you hear me? Hi. I hear you fine. Okay. Um, say a person decides that they want to become a uh, online learner, right? And the and they decide upon their niche. How do they go about finding an appropriate community to pursue their niche? Uh, well, that's an excellent question. Uh, pick a niche. Uh, say success. Success? <laughs> um, I'm not sure what that niche would be. Uh, but let, let, say uh, personal development. Personal development. Okay. So let's begin the way all learning experiences do online with Google. Personal development. Well, excellent. <laughs> All right, so here we have Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. So that's, that's a good start. Uh, and that might uh, point me to some resources. Um, and we have personal development for smart people. So I'm, I'm just going at the top. Right? And what I'm doing here is I'm just scoping out the area. And see, because I know... No matter what topic you raise, right, there are going to be resources scattered all over the internet. Uh, the problem is they're going to be all over the place. So what I'm doing here in Google, isn't that a funny image? Um, boredom cures. Personal development equals boredom cures. Okay. Uh, I'm just scanning. 
right? I don't expect Google to give me the answer. I expect Google to point me where to look, point me to where to look. Then the second thing I'll do, uh, if I'm you, right, is, and even if I'm me, is I don't have, uh, you know, a nice personal learning environment all set up now, so because the software doesn't exist yet, so I kind of have to make do with what's on the web. So the next thing I'll do is I'll go to Google Reader. And I'll create an account. So here's Google Reader. And what Google Reader is, is an RSS reader. It does the same thing that uh, the newsletter software did. And so now, what I'll do is, okay, so personal development. I'm still looking for personal development stuff. So learn Quebec EN content. So some stuff from Quebec. Okay, well, this looks pretty good. Looks from Quebec. Uh, looks reasonably authoritative. It's Canadian. So here's the XML. I'll click on the XML button. Here's the URL. I'll copy the URL, and that'll be my first feed in Google Reader. If I was using uh, the other software, Grasshopper, by the way, is what it's called. Uh, I think I told you that already. Uh, I would subscribe to the feed in Grasshopper. Here I subscribe to the feed in Google Reader because I don't have Grasshopper. So there, I've added the feed, and it's going to show me. So, well, this really wasn't really what I wanted, was it? So, okay. Goodbye. <laughs> you have to be ruthless, right? And, and you get the idea, right? So, uh, so, Basically, what happens now is I subscribe to a few feeds. Now I've got something going in Google Reader. And let, let's go to something I actually do have going in Google Reader, uh, my studies of cyber culture. So I'm interested in cyber culture. Over time, I've gathered various links in cyber culture, and I treat these as my daily newsletter. And every day I go into Google Reader, and uh, I do my reading in cyber culture. If I see readings that are useful or important to me, then I'll put it in delicious, or I have my own blog as well. So I might put it into my blog. I might create a new host in my, in my blog. And, of course, I'll tag it. Now it's personal development, so I'll come up with my own personal development tag, or, well, let's check and see if there's a tag in Delicious first. So, let's search Delicious personal development. It's finding a tag that other people would really be helpful. So, personal develop oh, development. Person there's personal development for smart people again. People like that. Oh, isn't that interesting? So, that's pretty popular. The nice thing about Delicious is it'll tell me... Uh, how popular these things are. So now the network's actually beginning to filter the content for me. Uh, Steve Pavlina's per personal development, not so popular, but uh, I don't know, back to the name, looks like it might be useful. So, uh, so I might add, I might add my uh, links to Delicious. I might use the development tag, and I don't know if I like that, iPhone development resources. Maybe there's another tag. Maybe I'll have to create a tag. Who knows? Uh, so, but you see what I mean, right? So, now I, I sort of extend my own network a bit. So, I look for a few things. I look at the things that are connected those, to those things. Gradually, I get a sense of the topology of the network. And then I begin layering my own topology on top of that by creating blog posts, uh, storing bookmarks and delicious. Uh, I might do an image search and, and uh, start storing images and Flickr, etc. Uh, if I really wanted to become involved in personal development, then I'd join the personal development community. I'd sign up for lists if there are any you know, personal development uh, lists or Oh, professional development of this service might be close. So, so I could subscribe to this by email. 
Now I'll start getting stuff in by email, but I might want to blog, but delicious. And I, I can go on, but you get the idea. I'm not trying to find some sort of authoritative content all neatly, one, two, three, four, and acquire that content. What I'm trying to do is find different resources, see what's connected to the topic of, of personal development, uh, and just get a feel for it. And then eventually, what I'm going to find is activities uh, and things that I can do, uh, conferences I can participate in, practices that I undergo. I don't know. I have no idea what the practices are in personal development, so uh, I'd have to make them up. But in photography, which is one of the ones that I do, uh, one of the practices is take a photo every day and post it. Uh, there are groups formed around this, and you participate in these groups, and the groups will... Everybody in the group will take a photo and post it online every day and they'll criticize each other's photos. There's another group where a person in their group actually gives people assignments. Go out and photograph parallel lines. Go out and photograph a reflection. You know what I mean? And people go out, they practice whatever it is, and the idea is them doing this practice uh, is, is what gives them the new skills. But also, this practice is supported with the discussion, with the posting online, with forums, with articles, help articles, uh, how to do with articles, and the like. And I'm sure that there are personal development activities out there somewhere as well. In fact, why don't I look for them? Because I think that my learning, oh, here we go, nine activities that improve personal development. And so here are my nine activities. And if I like this, if I think this is interesting, Let's do a search on Google to see who's linked to this page. Oh, nobody. <laughs> so, okay, has anybody linked to this website? No? Isn't that interesting? I would have thought somebody would have linked to it. So nobody has linked to this website. That's interesting. Well, if I think it's good, I should share it. Maybe it's brand new. Uh, and if I think it's bad, I should take the fact that nobody is linked to it as a bit of a warning. <laughs> You see what's happening, right? I'm in charge of this. I pursue my own interests here. I follow my own rabbit holes, if you will. Uh, I gain my own perspective on the topic of personal development. I've put aside the false notion that there is some thing out there that is quote-unquote personal development that is a common core of knowledge that everyone must know. Because any such statement is a statement of opinion. And you ask somebody else and you'll get a different such statement. So I'm putting aside the idea that there's some person who's the authority who will tell me and I make my own way through this world of personal development. Very long answer to a very simple question, but I hope it was helpful. Awesome, thanks. Any other questions? Have you done any um, looking into what, how people's learning styles affect their ability to do this kind of learning? Because it seems very reflective and research based. And so if you're not necessarily prone to that kind of learning style, is it? I don't know of any direct research on learning styles with respect to this approach to learning. I bet you it doesn't exist. Uh, I, I put money on it not existing. Uh, so I think it's a good question. The part of the problem is is that learning styles themselves, properly so called have received a bit of a rough ride in the educational research literature recently uh, with critics coming out and saying basically there are no learning styles. Now, me, I think there are learning styles. I, I think it's pretty obvious that people learn in different ways. And therefore, uh, different kinds of learning are more appropriate for different people. If I had to say off the top of my head, the best answer to that question would be 
uh, it would be something like, because this approach to learning allows people to choose how they learn, uh, people would be more likely to be able to choose learning that adapts to their own learning style. Somebody who is more activity-oriented, more kinesthetic, will do things like, well, the nine activities, whatever they are. I, I'm going to assume that, I don't know, this, uh, I haven't read this, so I can't really comment on it. But, you know, they'll actually be more inclined to do things rather than to read and reflect on it. Uh, different materials, you know, YouTube is an incredibly popular resource that I haven't touched on at all in this presentation, but which is totally unnatural. Uh, I'll bet you that I can find an RSS feed of personal development resources in YouTube. And if I'm visually oriented or perhaps audio oriented, then I'm going to want to get videos in the morning instead of articles. And I'll get my videos in my newsletter, I'll watch my videos. And if I'm visual and kinesthetic, I'll probably watch videos and do things along with them. Uh, you know, this is different from the other approach to adapting learning styles where you have some sort of course material that you're presenting to people in traditional learning, and now the very idea that people have different learning styles creates a real problem for you because in your instructional design, you have to be thinking, well, how do I deal with the kinesthetic learner? How do I deal with the visual learner? How do I deal, you know what I mean? And, you know, particularly if you take something like Myers-Briggs where, you know, uh, these people are introverts and those people are judgmental. You know, now I'm looking at, you know, uh, 16, is it? 16, whatever the number is, different kinds of learning styles that I'm trying to present to in this one learning material. And you can't do it. And just as an aside, this is probably why the research in learning styles has been such a failure, because if I'm presenting content to you, it's really hard, if not impossible, to present that content in such a way that I'm adapting to your learning style, because there are so many different learning styles. So the connectivist model where people map out and direct their own learning, in my view, probably helps people support learning according to their own learning style better than the traditional method. But that's a speculation. I, I gotta be very clear about that. That's a hypothesis that would need to be tested. Question I have, it's Bob Robinson. Question I have is, when you have 1,500 people in a course, uh, and you're going to be presenting people with certificates saying that they've done the course, how do you come out and say they've participated or they've actually done work or captured the knowledge that's out there that you want, want them to have before they get the certificate? Yeah, short answer is we don't. Uh, the longer answer is the theory proposes a separation between learning and evaluation. So the connectivist model that I just gave you focuses on learning. There would be a whole separate discussion regarding evaluation. Uh, and, and it's a discussion worth having. But the idea is that the evaluation of individuals is distinct from the environment in which they do their learning. Uh, you know, the, the classic case of this is where you know you go to law school or accounting school or whatever, you do all your studies, and then after you're done, you go before the bar or you go before CGA and you do their test. And if your learning was any good, you'll pass the test. Now that's a very simple, and really it's you know, a very simple model of a separation between learning and evaluation. What we did in the connectivist course, 
and uh, what we would offer in planks, except it just, just didn't happen. But but it did happen in the connectivist course is we had a small number of the participants in the course enrolled in a certificate class at the University of Manitoba. And they were given assignments from the University of Manitoba, which they completed, those were graded, and they received a grade in the course. That was like 22 people out of 2,200, or maybe 24 people out of 2,200, I forget the exact number. But what also happened in the connectivism course is we had people from other institutions saying, I want to take this course, I want to receive credit for it, uh, but I want to see, receive credit from my own institution. Well, we made the assessment criteria public. So the, 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 uh, the, the metrics, there's a word I'm searching for, but I can't find it. But you know, the, the things that we would look for, the, uh, the rubrics of assessment, we presented those because they were already created for the University of Manitoba. So this person goes back to their own department and say, here are the rubrics, here are the assignments. I'm going to do the assignments, but I'm not going to hand them in to the connectivism course. I'm going to hand them in to you, the, my instructor at such and such university. And you mark them. And that's exactly what happened. So we had people who were being evaluated by different institutions in different places, although they were in the same course. And this is how you approach evaluation in this kind of model. So everybody takes part in the same course, but different people are evaluated by different institutions based on different criteria that may be more or less related to the course, that may be a, a lower or higher uh, degree of difficulty. So the, the learning happens here, the assessment happens here. The idea is the learning helps or supports the assessment, but the assessment is done in a distributed manner, and then you get the certificate from whoever did the assessment. I think, just as an aside and a postscript, this is the model for assessment in the future. This is what's going to happen. Uh, I'm, you know, dollars to donuts, certain of this. Uh, we've already seen significant movement in this direction. We've seen computer software companies and that offering their own certification. Uh, we've seen distance learning institutions like the University of Phoenix offer uh, accredited certification of distance learning. And you know, if you're doing it by distance learning, really all you have to do is pass the assessment. Everything else is really on your own recognizance. Uh, and we're going to see more and more of this. Right now, the uh, colleges and universities basically have a monopoly on certification. And there are lots of reasons for that, and, and, and reasons that I actually agree with. But they're going to lose it. They're going to lose it because governments, particularly when faced with deficits, are not going to want to limit the students to having to go through a four-year university program in order to qualify for a degree, which the government has to pay for, if they can prove that they qualify for a degree with education that they pay for on their own, however they have managed to acquire it. So it's going to happen. There is going to be a separation of this uh, education or learning and uh, assessment. And then what's going to happen is people will participate in these networks, and then from time to time, they will undergo an assessment of some sort. And this assessment, well, there will be a very broad range of assessments, and different assessments will have different reputations based on how difficult it is to achieve the credential and how qualified the people are who have, in fact, achieved that credential. So, distributed, broken apart. Thank you. I, I have a question. <laughs> this is Rasheen, and I'm actually in your Plank course. Yeah. Um, earlier when you started, you talked about the wiki and how nobody's really gone in and made any changes to it. Do you, yeah. do you think that's in part because it is termed a course, 
and off yeah. with wikis um, or with a course, I guess people consider the content to be somewhat, I don't want to say stagnant, but you know, the content is there and so people feel like they don't want to change it. Do you think that will be part of it or? It's definitely part of it. You know, you say the word course and people you know, fall into these uh, preconceived notions. I think there's no question about it. Uh, but there's also, I mean, there's all sociology around wikis too. And, uh, you know, I think that people are less inclined to, to contribute to collaborative authoring than is widely suspected. Uh, people are, people will, well, people are endlessly creative. They'll do all kinds of things online. We've got ample evidence of that. But much less so collaboratively. There's a billion web pages, uh, but, you know, there's only a million or so Wikipedia pages. Uh, and the reason for that is people tend to prefer to create their own web pages rather than contribute to a Wikipedia page. You, you look at the contributorship, even of something as large as Wikipedia, and the core, considering it's drawn from you know, all Internet users, the core is actually fairly small. Uh, if you took the same metrics and applied them to a course the size of Planck, then you would have an active university community, or sorry, an active um, update and contribution community of, well, zero. That's what it rounds to, uh, because the participation is so small. And so I think it's as much to do with the sociology of wikis as it is to do with the fact that it's a course. It's as, it's as much to do with the general reluctance of people to work collaboratively, particularly on things that aren't their own, as opposed to working individually or in small groups on their own things. That is total speculation, though. That's a hypothesis that would need to be tested. Well, Stephen, thank you very much for, uh, for your great presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, very thought-provoking. And uh, we really appreciate uh, you taking your valuable time for you know to, to spend with us in this uh, in this forum here. So thank you again. Thanks a lot. I enjoyed doing it, and I look forward to seeing the recording, which I'm sure all the participants of the blank course will be interested in. So thanks a lot. Take care. Thanks.